Hello and welcome to the third year of the Inside Social Work podcast. I cannot believe that this has been going since 2019 and uh, I've had over 47 episodes. So just I'm blown away. I'm so grateful for this beautiful community who've been listening to the podcast and have been uh, reaching out to me through social media, through Instagram and LinkedIn um, and joining the Facebook group to share with me what they want to hear on the podcast, uh, what they've enjoyed and um, even people putting their hand up to share their stories. So thank you so much. Uh, The podcast has had over 44 thousand downloads and is reaching an international audience which is just amazing i i'm so thrilled uh, and really humbled by the interest in the podcast in today's episode uh, i have a return guest helen gray helen first joined the podcast uh in its first year so back in uh episode nine uh, which i encourage you to listen to if you haven't heard helen's story she really shares a lot about her own journey uh, the impact that burnout had on her and uh, it's really fueled her new I guess fusion or career path uh, providing a lot of training consulting supervision and coaching to support other workers in the field in today's episode we move a little bit away from general burnout and we look at how we return to work following um, a few years of either remote education or remote work uh, where a lot of students have had placements either online um, graduates have often been employed and inducted and starting jobs again online because of the pandemic and so we tried to incorporate some of these um, new hurdles and new challenges into what we already know works for self-care. Helen and I both share some of the things that we do and the things that we found helpful throughout our careers and then Helen gives you some ways that you can get in touch with her if you'd like to find out a little bit more about her services or connect with her through her social media and perhaps attend one of her workshops or training. Without further ado, here is my interview with Helen Gray. Okay, welcome to the first episode of the Inside Social Work podcast for 2022. Um, I have a returning guest, Helen Gray, with me today. Helen, do you want to introduce yourself to the listeners who might not have caught your first episode? Thank you, Marie. It's great to be back with you. And yes, as you say, I'm Helen. I am a qualified social worker. I've been in the profession for over 20 odd years now. I don't like to put an exact date (laughs) on it. (laughs) Um, But what people might not know about me if they haven't come across my work before is that, yes, I'm an experienced practitioner, but also six, seven years ago, I experienced burnout and really ended up stepping away away from the direct practice element of the profession as a result of my experiences there. But from that, um, I was forced to make a decision or I chose to make a decision to start putting myself first. And I really, over the last number of years, have taken significant action to use my experience as a social worker, use my experience of burnout to really inform how I can support other practitioners to thrive doing the work that we all love and not get to that that point of burnout. So now it's great that I have that opportunity to be able to contribute back into the sector um, through my coaching, through my workplace training, and through um, group work with individuals and organizations. So yeah, it's a bit of a a long story but that was a very brief overview of it <laughs> yeah and we can um I think you went into a lot more detail in that first episode so we'll Definitely. put a I'll put a link to that um in the notes as well so people can listen to a bit more of your story fantastic uh we were talking today about we've been wanting to do a second episode around burnout but uh it feels really timely to start talking about how we manage those who are already might be burning out but also adapting to change so a lot of students um, may have done all their placements online Um, some have had their graduate positions be online and now people are going back into either full-time in-person roles with you know still distressed clients distressed communities communities recovering from 
you know, from COVID, from natural disasters, you know, we've got uh, social workers working in all sectors. I thought that would be a good place to start is how we can apply your program and your skills into that returning to work. Um, I guess. Yeah, Marie, I think it's a it's a really important conversation that we that we do have at this time because the demand for the services that social workers and you know all welfare based practitioners offer is only increasing. Um, unfortunately, the resources to fund that are not necessarily increasing as required, but you know the demand is always increasing. I think at the start of the pandemic, I, I penned a blog on my website that said, we're going to need you when this is over. And that was oh, two years ago now. And I don't think I anticipated at that point how long you know, this pandemic and all of these challenges would be. But the reality is we as practitioners and as a profession absolutely need to be ensuring that well-being is a priority for all of us, whether that is, as you say, those experienced practitioners who's, who have been working throughout the last couple of years and before, or whether it's the new graduates coming into the field, because well-being is not something that we pay attention to when it's a problem. Ideally, well-being is something that we integrate intrinsically into our professional practice from those absolute first days as a graduate, as an absolute, you know, even go back to when you're on your student placement. Because the way that I have learned to view well-being, and I say that because I had to learn how to position well-being in my mind because it wasn't a natural thing. But it really is about viewing well-being as a core element of both my personal and professional practices. Um, and that's about thinking about how do we integrate it? How do we make sure that the small things that we can do consistently to support our well-being are actually integrated into our professional working mm. days, as well as our mindset about how we operate and how we present as professional practitioners. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like that um, idea of integrating it into professional practice because it makes me think of uh, general health care or, you know, an example around, you know, dental hygiene. You can't just brush your teeth for an hour on a Sunday and hope for the next two weeks it's fine. It's small things often over yep. time have a really big impact. And that's that's critical because as practitioners, I think we might know some of the, you know, we might know some of the ideas, some of the skills, some of the techniques, but whether we are able to prioritize the time and the energy and the intervention in ourselves to put those into practice, you know, is, is the question. And I think that, you know, often because of the nature of our work, because of the demands for practitioners to be on, always on, always doing the work. Yeah. It's really easy to think I'll get round to me later. Yeah. And that is the, that's the mindset that I had for many years. And it is the mindset that led to my burnout. So, you know, I do, you know, I do draw on my personal story as a way of you know, reminding people that, you know, burnout isn't something that happens to somebody who can't cope. Burnout actually is something that happens to people who cope too well, who potentially keep going, keep mm. striving, keep trying to do everything without really paying attention to their needs in the process. Yeah, absolutely. I have... <laughs> So there's a couple of questions I want to throw at you. Um, Go for it. One is how can people balance when stretching themselves and pushing themselves because there's a learning curve and when do they know maybe this is too much for me? So sort of like an anxiety um, where, you know, if something makes us anxious, we know from a treatment perspective it's best not to avoid it because that actually reinforces the anxiety. So how can new grads or people who've maybe had a career change or changing jobs, how can they know 
that it's a good amount of stretch and they need to keep pushing through it? And when do they need to start thinking this might be a sign of burnout and I need to pull back a little bit? Like, is there a way to kind of yeah. figure out where's the healthy point of pushing through and when to pull back? Look, that's a really important question. Again, I think, you know, the starting point is, is that everybody is different. What everybody is holding, their their work, their personal, and also the experiences that they bring is different. So there is no, you know, one size fits all answer. But I view burnout very much as a continuum and not necessarily one that you just have to step up, but one that you ebb and flow on as we go through day-to-day life. Um, The statistics, you know, that have been thrown around about burnout, you know, that 70% of people experience burnout, we might experience periods where we are overwhelmed, where we are under pressure. And as you say, there's there's a juggling act between, well, that's something that I need to do to get through this moment. That's something that I need to do to manage what's happening. But we always need to be able to allow ourselves to get back to that equilibrium, to get back into a sense of balance. And the risk for, as I see it, for that creeping burnout is when our perception of what is expected, what is normal, what is okay, starts to shift and creep up. So that we actually assume that, well, this is just the way it has to be. This is the way it is. And sometimes that can prevent us from allowing ourselves, giving ourselves permission to take that break, to do the things that we need to do. So, you know, I I think that there are levels. Mm -hmm. There are times that jobs, if, you know, it would be naive to say that you can get a balanced day and you can always carve out time for yourself you can because we know that that's not the reality of our profession however I think that it's about thinking about how we reframe our mindset to knowing that it's okay to build in those moments that are needed for the long term Hmm. so yep you might have to strive for you know like you say students in placement there's a whole period where it's really (laughs) intense exactly we know the intensity of that period is phenomenal but it is a learning period. There is, you know, a time end to it. There is a a clear structure Mm. around it. And for practitioners coming out of, you know, training, starting that work, they have to realize that that is an ongoing for, you know, the next 10, 20, 30 years, hopefully. Mm. And therefore we, it's thinking about how do we build in already to our starting days those moments that we can then sustain us through so yep there's got to be there's always going to be moments of challenge and one of the things that I like one of the ways to think about well-being that I really like is um, something that Michelle McQuaid and her team talk about which is the fact that well-being involves moments of thriving and moments of struggle and it's actually not about needing everything to be smooth but it's about how do we manage to thrive even when we're experiencing the challenge and the struggle of say our work. And so it's a balance between, you know, managing well-being and managing the challenge and the struggle that you're faced with. Yeah. I really love that. That moment of thriving and moments of struggle captures it so beautifully. One of the the things we often talk about with self-care and prevention of burnout is, you know, these small moments of exercise, sleep, eating well. But lately I've been thinking around what works for me and for people I, um, I've i supported. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this is those bigger picture things around professional learning, uh, engagement in the identity, networking, um, peer supervision, for, like, and, and, I, and I wonder whether you see where you see the struggle lies because I think that those the people I know who've done it well and who have got so much energy to keep going have put all those things in place sometimes at a financial cost to themselves I'll pay for supervision or a time commitment where they have a monthly practice group or peer group um, a special interest group and you know I found that my um, I mean the special interest group and a particular therapeutic modality group 
and that was the the two consistent things I did throughout the kind of two year pandemic that made me feel so contained uh, and supported because other people were going through the same thing. And we'd already had an established group um, that I don't know how, if I could have kept doing the work that I was doing without that. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are and how people can adopt some of that and not expect it to be paid for by work or always in yeah. work time. I, I love that because it, it brings to the four two elements for me. One is about the importance of investing in ourselves. And yes, we can say it should be provided by my organization, it should be paid for whatever. The reality is that's not always the case. And it doesn't have to be a financial investment, but it is about being prepared to invest in yourself. And that is about time, energy. And yes, occasionally it is about pay, you know, paying for something outside of the work area. But the mindset around why you're doing that is, is what's important because we know that as practitioners, we are our most valuable resource. So it's not just investing, as I said, on, in ourselves in terms of you know, money, but it's also about thinking, well, what is it that we're wanting to add in for ourselves? You know, it might be around that whole idea of you know, mental stimulation, keeping you invigorated and, and up to date with the things that fuel your passion, maintaining that purpose and that motivation for what you do. There's some great work that um, is using the PERMA model which is a six pillars of well-being. It's based on the original work of Martin Seligman, but has been extended by um, Michelle McQuaid and her group of researchers. And that has six pillars. And it talks about you know, the importance of positive emotions for well-being. It talks about the importance of engagement, you know, how engaged we are in our life and our purpose and the things that we're doing. It talks about the importance of relationships. And that's what you were saying, Marie, that importance of the connection, having those positive relationships. But it also identifies the importance of meaning, purpose and accomplishment for our well-being alongside those core health elements. So when we think of well-being, it's a complex area. And whilst I know as practitioners, as you know, social workers, as, as people in this sector, we like research, we like evidence-based. The reality is, you know, that research tells us what works for some of the people some of the time, that old adage. So it is about working out what different things make a difference for your well-being. Yeah, I really love that. And the I like that PERMA model. I think that's a really good one I've used in organizations before. Yep. How do you how do we digest this to new grads? So, you know, there is I really like the title of your um essay or blog that you wrote we're going to need uh, when this is over we're going to need you or what was it we're going to need you when this is over we'll need you more when it's over that's right yeah how do we digest and d distill this into workable pieces for someone who's finally graduated probably super excited that they survived placement or maybe in their first few years trying to figure out which area they most enjoy getting their technical skills you know honed in and focused and now we're adding in all of this stuff as well like how do we what are yeah. some small either practices or habits or if someone was you know listening to this and thought okay when I get off this you know put my headphones out and stop, finish this episode here are a few different things I can do like where can they start yeah it's always a great question look um to give a context around that I use what I call my four A's of well-being model as just a tool to help people think about where do I need to focus my attention on at the moment so those four A's are the first one is awareness, you know, so part of how we, you know, how we learn, how we support ourselves in our practice as well is by increasing our awareness. So when it comes to well-being, it might be thinking about, well, what is that that I need? Where is it that I need it? What am I actually experiencing? So as new grads coming out, it's really tuning into, well, what's going on for me in this new work environment? What is it that I'm faced with? How is How am I reacting to that? What is it that is occurring around me? And that awareness can come in, in many different ways but it's a it's a key element of tuning in to what you're experiencing and then the second element of these four a's is all about ability 
and that's about developing the specific skills and tools so that you can respond as you need to be. The third element is application. And I say that this is the element, as I've said already, that as practitioners we're the worst at, is actually putting it into practice on a day-to-day -day regular basis. So thinking about, well, what do you need to apply consistently to support yourself? And then the fourth A in the, the four A's of well-being is all about accountability. How do you hold yourself accountable to valuing yourself as much as your clients, in fact, valuing yourself first, but also what else do you need for your accountability? You mentioned, Marie, you know, that group that you had, that professional group, not only did it provide you with support, you know, relationships, connection, professional stimulation, I'm sure it was also, you know, somewhere that you committed to turning up and just giving yourself that permission, that accountability to do something for you on a regular basis so go on yeah absolutely I mean and for me I have a mixture of things that are both a time investment and a cost investment so some of the groups when I first started out were um were just peer groups so they mm. didn't actually cost anything but yes they were I either had to get permission from work to leave early or this particular one is sort of you know seven seven thirty on a the first Wednesday of every month so there is there is a time sometimes I think, oh, it's, you know, especially in winter, it's cold and gray and dinner's yummy. And I, I don't want to you know do this. And then I always love it once I'm there and I feel so connected to others that um, it doesn't have to be a, a financial investment, but the commitment and showing up yeah. is so valuable because it's preventative, right? I have a group of people I can contact absolutely if I ever need anything. Yep. And part of the part of this mindset around well-being is about being able to see that it is an ongoing process it's the it's the tiny things that you do consistently it's not an end point you know we don't get to a point and go tick I've done my well-being my well-being's under check it's all okay it's a continual evolution and that's why I say that it's essential that we think about how do we just integrate it into our day-to-day -day life not only in our practices so not only in that ability and that application but also in the way that we frame it the value that we place on ourselves and the the interventions that we you know that we choose yeah that's a great one um what do you do what are your <laughs> what are your go-to um ways of managing burnout and well-being because I think we use it all kind of interchangeably but I guess well-being and, and self-care can prevent burnout, but sometimes it, it might not as well. Um, but what are you? What have you learned? What's what's been working for you? For me, the idea of small things done consistently is critical. Um, I was always a bit of an all-or-nothing person. I was a bit of a perfectionist. I was, a, you know, going at things, and if you know if it didn't make momentum cha momentous changes straight away, well, then what was the point of it? But when I, when I experienced my burnout, and when I talk about my burnout, I tipped over the edge. So not everybody's experience of burnout will result as mine did in you know, a sobbing wreck in a psychiatrist's office, losing my profession. That's the extreme end of burnout. But the small habits that we do consistently is where I realized that's the gold. That's the magic. You know, if you want a, if you want an answer, to me, that's the answer to well-being. The small things that resonate with you, that take you a step towards feeling better about things that you do consistently. So for me, it's a it's a combination of different things. Um, I do have a little a little tiny accountability group, three of us. And I use that as a daily intention posting and intention setting. So for about two years now, I have been doing a daily intention that I share in my little you know, peer group as a way of setting myself up for the day. That is a really valuable tool and a great one that can be easily replicated at no cost. Um, I am a big user, if that's the right word, of 
reframing the stories that I tell myself. So my mindset reframe is a, is a key tool to my well-being. Um, and I'm also learning, have taught myself the importance of being okay with carving out moments for myself, um, which I know as I know as practitioners in a busy working day, it's far easier to say than it is to do. Mm. But it's not about big moments. It's about intentional micro moments. It's about really getting the benefit of those moments through the thoughts that come around it. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole different group of practices. Um, you know, I spent a whole year writing a gratitude journal every morning to teach myself and reframe my thoughts around gratitude. So gratitude is a core go-to for me. Now I know that that can sound, you know, it's banded around everywhere and it's a, you know, it's a really simple solution, but, you know, some of these things compounding together are what start to build those foundation blocks for well-being. And they give you that, they can support you with some fallbacks when things get challenging. Yeah, I really love that. Um, I think that, I, I think what you were saying around the accountability of having your small group, like I know for me personally, I'll do better and more consistent if it's with somebody else. Um, so whether it is you just, you know, you know, in a WhatsApp group, set your intention or, you know, even regular exercise, if I'm meeting a friend, like I, I know that that works for me. So I think that's a really interesting um, yep. way to incorporate the connection but also maybe a, a practical thing like journaling or gratitude absolutely I mean I you know I work through a coaching model so I work with people one-on-one -on -one as a coach and also in small groups and some of the you know that that coach can be an accountability but often some of the skills that we learn by you know participating in coaching or in workshops and things we can then apply in these informal free you know buddy peer group accountability sessions so accountability can be very different for different people um but it's working out what works for you you know and surrounding yourself with a, a little group of people who also believe and will champion your well-being as you champion theirs so you know there is there is power in those those peer groups yeah i think that's great and in terms of um, workplaces, what are some people, I mean, people have very different experiences of support in their workplace. What's a way that somebody can perhaps reach out to a, a team leader, a coordinator, a manager, like how can they maybe incorporate some of what we've talked about into their role? Um, like the first thing that comes to my mind is like a CPD plan, because I know like learning energizes me and I feel more connected to the profession when I'm learning um, for other people that's supervision for some it's um, you know scaffolded learning if they're not feeling confident in their skill set like what are some things or conversations people can have with their workplace look I think it's important to recognize that well-being and you know that whole sense of professional well-being being able to do your job well is both an individual and a collective responsibility you know I love the idea that well-being operates at those three different levels the me level so the individual what you do yourself to support yourself but it also operates at that team organizational level what's happening in that immediate group around you either your colleagues at work or your peers or your family because those interactions can really influence your well-being and then it operates at that broader you know structural the organization the system the society that you're in level so when you're in the workplace it's really useful to think about what is it that a you can do for yourself but also where's the area that you want to you know where's the area that inspires you to agitate for change if that makes sense you know as as practitioners we're, we're you know we're passion driven a lot of the time you know maybe if you are somebody who is you know an advocate at heart then actually doing something more at that sort of like you know whole of organization level leading a you know a, a, a day or doing something you know promoting it at that broader organizational level and trying to influence there might be what not only 
can have a, an impact on well-being, but also lights you up and fuels your passion. And um, if that's not your area, maybe it is that, you know, leading something just within the team or putting suggestions into the team to, you know, maybe we could incorporate some reflection or some mindfulness into how we do our, our day. So, you know, there's no there's no easy answer. Um, and often as, you know, as as new new people into a team or new people into the social work field, you might think, you know, who am I to say to offer ideas and offer suggestions? But sometimes we can all benefit from that, you know, new new wave of enthusiasm of, of people coming into the team to say, well, you know, maybe we could get together and, you know, just have a chat at lunchtime, or maybe we could go for a walk, or maybe we could, you know, try something different. So yeah, I think that it's it's hard to, if you think about trying to change the whole system, then we can almost be disempowered to the point that we do nothing. And the way that I like to to think about well-being in the workplace and, and supporting ourselves professionally in the workplace is look at what's within your immediate control. So that is the things that you can do yourself. And that's where, you know, that awareness around how you, you know, how you frame your mindset, how you think about prioritizing your needs, how you develop those habits, how you integrate that into your day, those individual level things, that's your easiest point of control. But we also, you know, want to impact that well-being upwards within our teams and outwards within the system as well. So, you know, finding the bit that sparks your interest is a, is a really good way to go. Yeah, I think that's so many great tips there. So um, hopefully our listeners have taken a few ideas. One thing I just I wanted to add before we wrap up um, and whether you've had this experience where people sometimes forget that you can ha have a supervisor just for a few sessions to help get you through a workplace um, challenge or issue. I find that people wait until it's so bad and their mental health is suffering that they then use like a mental health care plan to talk about it with a therapist. And, and I wonder what are your thoughts on how do we reframe that and think we can actually have a few supervision sessions that still touch on mental health and the impact, but it's before the problem has gotten um, maybe that overwhelming or has affected our mental health that that much yeah look I am really keen to bringing as many different types of support to practitioners we sometimes are guilty of just being grateful for what we've got you know you might get access to monthly group supervision and you're grateful for that and I think what you said there is really important we actually can take you make use of a whole variety of supports and and different modalities to be that ongoing support rather than as you say wait until the end so whether it's um jumping into a you know a, a short-term group supervision to to give you a boost whether it's in terms of what I do linking into a you know a workshop around developing you know mindset and coaching and self-awareness skills whether it's jumping into you know six eight weeks of, of coaching to support yourself those preventative models are really important um you know we we are not great as a profession at taking what we need as practitioners in those early stages and I think this is where we can sometimes you know struggle because I know and if I draw back on my personal example um when I sought help I, I as I say I'd fallen off the edge of that cliff it was too late to use some of these strategies so I spent years re you know resetting my mindset you know reworking the way that I see myself and prioritizing my well-being so I think it's really important what you say there about you know as practitioners I encourage you to look out and see what's there you know explore some of the things there's lots of things that are going on in terms of like you know free events and workshops there's lots of short-term things or as you say you know a couple of preventative 
sessions to, you know, work through some issues that are arising either with supervision or with um, coaching. So it's not about fixing. Um, the thing that I love about coaching as a modality is it's very much about peers and it's very much about co-creating from the resources and the energy that is already in existence with you as a client. Um, so it is not only a tool to support you to you know, get results and make changes, but it's also a really valuable way of learning skills so that you can then have a broader tool set to support yourself. Yeah, there's so many beautiful things in what you said. So thank you for all those really handy tips. If people want to learn more about what you do, and I'll grab, um, I'll get a link from that um, article that you mentioned, and we'll put a link to the other episode as well. But how can people reach out to you and um, get in contact or access what you're offering? Look, if you are interested in learning a bit more about what I do and how I work, then I'm running a free um, workshop, a one hour workshop called Reset Your Mindset. Um, depending on when this podcast goes to air, that's in on the 29th of March. But it's also about being able to just access me through the social media, through LinkedIn and through my website, which is helengray.com.au. When I do coaching, I work with a one-on-one. -on -one. I've got a Reignite, which is a professional um, coaching program, which is really useful for practitioners, both at that early stage to set themselves up with some really good skills and mindset and awareness about how to go forward as a practitioner or as a tool for um, practitioners further down in the stage to really think about how do they want to um, refocus on their well-being. Excellent. Thank you. And um, I'll put links to that as well in the show notes. The other thing that would be amiss of me not to mention is, as I said to you, I think, you know, I love working at both the individual level, but also at that more organizational level. And so coming up over the next couple of months, I'm collaborating with um, a lady called Kate Taylor, who is a specialized recruitment worker. Um, and we're delivering what we call Thriving Through Change, some leadership workshops for social welfare organizations, which is a combination of both looking at what do we, what do organizations need to do with their leaders and their leaders to support well-being filtering through the organization, but also what is it, as we say, in this changing face of reality that organizations can do to recruit and retain the quality um, workforce that they need to be able to keep delivering services for clients. So again, that can be found through um, links on my website and I'll share the link with you for those um, Thriving Leadership Through Change workshops. Great. So, Thank you. Yeah, Kate's been on the podcast a couple of times ah, as there you well. Go. Yeah, so she's so... familiar to our, our, our yeah. regular listeners. Thanks so much for your time today. You are most welcome. I hope that it was useful for you and for your listeners. I hope Thank you. Enjoyed you. My conversation with Helen, uh, managing self care and reducing burnout are so important. We have some really incredible workers in our field who are at capacity. So keep in mind uh, what you need, where you're at each day. And don't forget to look out for your for your peers, for your buddies. Um, this can be one of the most rewarding and amazing jobs. And I'd love to see people feeling connected and enthused um, throughout their whole social work career. Uh, it'd be really great if you could leave a rating and a review uh, on iTunes or wherever it is you get your podcast. Uh, feel free to jump on onto Facebook if you're still on Facebook. I know uh, not everybody is these days. There's a Facebook group there you can jump on or you can follow me on Instagram uh, at Marie Bacarcus, uh, or contact me through LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear what you're doing, what your stories are. And I'm always looking for uh, contributions to the podcast. So feel free to email me. I, I read all the emails and I try and incorporate as much of your feedback and ideas into the podcast as I can. Okay, well, have a lovely day. Thank you.